Hello again, everybody. This is Paul Steigerwald. Time for another Stanley Cup Rewind. Some memories as we go down memory lane to the 1991 Stanley Cup Championship. And, uh, well, the three guys that are joining me right now were so important to, to the Penguins. Uh, how important? Well, there was no way the Penguins win the Stanley Cup in 91 without the big trade they made on March 4th to, require, to acquire Ron Francis, Alf Samuelson, and Grant Jennings. And what a great reunion this is to have all three of them with us. Uh, to talk about what happened in 1991. Welcome, guys. Uh, everybody safe, I take it? Everybody's Healthy. good. Thank you. Yeah, no, everything's good. Everything's good. Wow, look at Nate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I do remember still. Hat. I'll have to send you, you a that. Penguins hat, um, Jenner, if, if that's okay. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I got one. <laughs> guys, if you could take me back to, uh, to March 4th. Uh, I, I know uh, I read an article uh, Grant, where, where apparently you were the first one to be informed uh, of a trade, and you knew that a couple other guys were going to be traded, but you didn't know who. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, EJ called me about ten o'clock at night, and he said, "You're go you're getting traded to Pittsburgh, and there's a couple of people who are going to be in the trade, but I can't tell you who they are." He said, "Be at the airport at six. So I said, "Okay," <laughs> packed the bag, and um, and then when I showed up in the uh, at the uh, airport at six, that's when I found out who was coming to. Pittsburgh. You remember that, Ron? You know, we had just had Caitlin on February 5th, so that was our first child. My my parents, that was their first grandparent, our grandchild, and excited to get down to see her. Uh, they came in, and we just finished dinner, and it was about 9.30, we're cleaning the table, and EJ called and said that I'd been traded. Um, <laughs> dealt with the media, got everything packed, and headed to the airport the next morning and found, uh, found Grant there as well. What do you remember... Uh kind of talking about among the three of you as you were, you know, getting ready to get on the plane and just headed to Pittsburgh. What were your general group thoughts about it and what were your individual thoughts, Alfie? Well, I think uh, we were all, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of in a shock because it happened so quick. We got the call late and, you know, for me it was, uh, yeah, well, for, I think for everyone it's the first trade. And I, you know, figured you had a few days to get your things collected and gathered and, you know, closed bank accounts, whatever. Uh, no, but the, the packing started immediately. So to me, it was like a little overwhelming and, and, and then, you know, started getting a little excited about the opportunity. And, and um, I think we had a good idea on, on what Pittsburgh needed and what we could provide as a group. And I think we were all very excited. What was uh, the feeling like in the Penguins room when you first arrived? Because, you know, they had traded Johnny Cullen, who was a very popular player, um, you know, with your n newest teammates, Kevin Stevens and so on. Bill Bork, those guys were all really tight. Mark Recchi with, with Cully. So how was it when you first went in the room at that point? I thought it was good. I mean, um, you know, that's it's an interesting year. They lose Mario with the back surgery, and he's out most of the year. And Cully steps in and, does, and uh, you know, keeps him in the hunt. And then, you know, unfortunately for him, he's part of the trade going the other direction. And, and as you said, a lot of close friendships in the room. And obviously, I think it's tough. Um you know, what I do remember is, uh, I think it was a couple days later or a week later within that, uh, Barry Peterson uh, was having a birthday party and we're all at the function. And over the course of the night, a couple of guys had kind of come up and said to me, obviously really tough losing Johnny, but glad to have you on board. And, uh, you know, let's go, let's go try and win a cup. And, and I think that put me at ease and I'm sure it put, uh, put Grant and Alfie at ease as well. You guys went on. A, well, first of all, Ron, you ended up wearing number nine, and you mentioned Barry Peterson. He was number ten, if I'm not mistaken. So, why nine, though? What was there any re any particular reason for that? No, not really. I'd wore four my first year in Carolina, and then they gave me ten. I wore ten every year. I came to uh, Pittsburgh, and Barry was wearing ten, and uh, I just said, you know, whatever. They gave me number nine. It was interesting. I don't think I scored a goal in the first. I don't know, eight, ten, twelve games, and I started to get. People sending me uh, texting the numbers, Jinx, please switch the number, get out of number nine. And, and <laughs> things kind of settled down and, and it worked out all right three months later. <laughs> and I read where where Jenner was actually leading you guys and scoring for a while there. He was, right. which wasn't supposed to I happen. I right? scored the first game. Yeah. We played Vancouver that first night there. And I ended up putting one in the top shelf somehow. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Yeah, I was leading. I was leading score on that trade for a couple of weeks there. People were starting to look at me, you know, kind of funny. But they, <laughs> they, Ronnie ended up catching up, of course. <laughs> yeah, you sure did. You guys went six zero and one right after the trade. That was the first seven games. You're six zero and one. You went on a nine three and two run. You win the Patrick Division. You go into the playoffs, and we'll 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 go. We're gonna 
uh, brush past all that because the purpose of this is to obviously talk about what happened in the Stanley Cup final against the Minnesota North Stars. So um, by the time you got to that point, uh, Alfie, you had uh, had a, suffered a broken hand earlier in the playoffs against the New Jersey Devils. How did you manage to play with that broken hand for that, uh, especially at the beginning when you when you first sustained it? I know you missed a couple, well, couple of games. First, first, first of all, I'd like to comment on Grant Jennings, said he scored top shelf. <laughs> I, I, I never saw that myself, so we, we, we may have to, to see some video on that because that sounds suspicious. <laughs> oh, but anyways, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the hand was um, – I remember when I did it too. It was like such a dumb play. I know Ronnie tells the story all the time. It was the end of the game, and and they were trying to ice the puck to shoot the puck down, and I was kind of the puck was coming right at me. So I took my right hand and kind of stuck stuck it up there for no reason at all. And as soon as it happened, it sang like crazy. And I said, "Oh, you're so stupid." <laughs> but uh, you know, we we had great doctors at the time in Pittsburgh. You know, they were able to kind of work with it and, and freeze it down for games and make a special cast. So everyone felt really sorry for me when I walked around town after the game. So it was, <laughs> uh, it was cool. I believe that uh, Phil Bork told me that uh, it, there was a pretty much of an in indication from every time you had to get that needle put in your hand that it hurt a little bit. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, – it was different back then <clears throat> what uh, you could play with and what was allowed through the doctors and all that, but uh, it, it was all good. Ronnie, uh, uh, maybe I think it'd be fun to kind of talk about how things went in that in that series against Minnesota to start with because you had lost the first game of every series leading up to the final and bounced back to win game two. And the same thing <clears throat> happened in this particular series. You lost five to four in game one in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and what was the feeling going into game two in terms of the, you know, the, the urgency of uh, it being in now in the Stanley Cup final and you don't want to go down two games to none? Well, before I get to that, just a, a quick comment on Alfie's broken hand. Uh, <laughs> I remember him doing it in the game seven and, and it was uh, the next round. Uh, we were staying in the lovely hotel right across from the Igloo at the time. My wife, Mary Lou, and I and Caitlin in a, in a one-bedroom place. <laughs> Alfie was uh, in a place there, and uh, Jeanette was pregnant and not in town at the time. So Alfie would come down, and we'd have kind of tea and toast before we headed over to the rink. And so he walked in, and Mary Lou made us a tea and toast. And I said, how's the hand? And he shook his head, nah, it's not going to it's not gonna be good enough. I said, you don't think you can play? And he said, nah, I don't think we can play. So we started walking down to the hotel lobby and across the street and getting closer to the rink. And I see him kind of looking at his hand. And I said, how's the hand now? He's like, ah, you know, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next thing I know, he gets in the locker room and I see him doctoring the glove up with the, the orthoplastic <laughs> protected. And I just started smiling. I knew he was on the lineup. So uh, it was good to have him back on board. And, uh, but yeah, the, the playoffs, I mean, um, certainly I think in that situation, we, were, we had lost games before and we were able to bounce back. So I think we had that confidence in our ability. But I think under that kind of situation and that pressure, you don't want to go down 0-2 heading into their building with, with games three and four on the road. So it was uh, it was critical to win that first one for sure. You guys uh, uh, in the game two got involved in a game that was extremely crazy. I, I don't know if you remember this, but there were – I wrote down the number. There were like 24 minor penalties called in that hockey game. It, it, it just became uh, just a, you know, a kerfuffle out there basically, but – uh, you, you were able to kind of overcome that. Uh, and if you remember, uh, the North Stars were a team that had, uh, well, were on the way to the final. They had broken the NHL record for power play goals in a playoff year. Uh, they ended up with 35. I think they had 32 going into that series. And they had four power plays early in that game, too. And you guys were able to kill them all. And eventually, Bob Airy scored a shorthanded goal, penalty kill. Uh, I think it was on the fourth power play that they had. And that was a big deal because, you know, they, they obviously were a team that was thriving on the power play. You guys figured out a way to fill those penalties. You remember that? You remember what it felt like to get the first goal in game two, knowing how big that game was and what you guys were doing against that penalty kill? Yeah, I, I do remember. <clears throat> I remember, you know, sometimes you get into these groups where, you, where you're, you're playing against a, a power play that's had some tremendous success going into it. So the focus is obviously high and they, they had, the, you know, they didn't have quite the superstars as we had, but they had a lot of good players that could put two power play units together. So 
you know, for us to get into a groove there and, and just work really hard, good as a group together was uh, certainly a big key in, in that game. I remember also Marius had a pretty cool goal that game, but uh, the PK, I think, laid the foundation for, 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 for his success and our win that game. And with a little minute, less than a minute left, <clears throat> Ronnie, uh, Artie scored a big goal to make it 2-0 uh, on, on a power play. Um, so you went, you came out of that first period having killed all those penalties and up to nothing. And uh, obviously special teams and goaltending is always huge in the playoffs. And that was starting to take shape, I thought, in, in, uh, in this game and throughout the rest of the series. Yeah, I think for sure. I, I think, you know, coming into that series, if I recall, I think they were clicking at about 33%, which was, was leading the playoffs uh, in power play percentage. I think I was, I was going to say they had the first five power plays of the game. Uh, maybe it was four in the first period, but you know, I think Tommy was real good in that first period for us. Made a lot of key saves, and and uh, I mean the way Tommy was able to play that puck, you know, the way he used to come back behind the net and just fire it. I don't think they were used to that uh, playing against a goalie that could actually fire that puck up, you know, around the glass like Tommy could. That helped a lot when you know when it comes to penalties, you know, for sure. Penalty well, I thought it was interesting, uh, General. Uh, quickly, the hatred boiled up. Between the two teams because you hadn't seen each other for months because you're from different conferences and, and, and in the second game already it looked like you were rivals you'd been rivals for 10 years you, you know what i mean was, they were they yeah. were kind of a nasty bunch and, and they kind of brought out the nastiness in you guys right yeah they were easy to hate you know for sure i mean <laughs> a lot of chirping out there and um you know i mean questionable hits and stuff like that so you know, it was playoff hockey so you know Oh, yeah, it became a rivalry there for a couple of weeks, that's for sure. Ronnie, do you remember um, how much speed there was in the neutral zone? I was, you know, as a, as a guy who was, in your case, so good at defending and coming back and reading the play, you know, and transition in the neutral zone, I, I was watching the game, game uh, too, and I, I couldn't believe just throughout that series how much speed both teams were generating through the, between the blue lines every game. It was just like – Almost like fire wagon hockey. It was so different from the way the game's played now. Uh, what was that like playing in a game like that, where you know if you turn the puck over, there's going to be great chances at both ends, and the goaltending had to be spectacular. You know. Well, I'm sure uh, you know Tommy didn't like it as much as we did, but uh, <laughs> you know that was one thing coming into the series. I remember people talking about we hadn't faced a team with that kind of speed before. Minnesota had a lot of speed, and how were we going to handle it? Um, you know, I just think we felt with our lineup uh, from from the depth in our forward positions to, you know, the strength on our back end to our goaltending that, you know, if anybody wanted to run and gun with us, we uh, we liked our chances in those kind of games. And, uh, you know, that game uh, certainly turned into one of those running game adventures. You had a lot of face-offs against Bobby Smith, Ron. Do you remember uh, the battles you had in the, in the face-off circle with him? Did have a lot. Didn't win them all, but uh, hopefully won more than 50%, so that's good. <laughs> What did it mean to get that win in game two, just to, to be able to you know, get back on track and, and, uh, and, and start to feel like you, you had those guys measured a little bit in terms of what you were going to be up against in the, play, in that, the rest of that series? Uh, yeah, no, that was obviously a, a big game because we, we, we've heard and how loud and how noisy their building was and you know how hot they were and the sort of the Cinderella story of the whole franchise turning around. So they, they had a lot of momentum going. and. Uh, that's something we talked about earlier. <clears throat> we had managed our uh, ups and downs fairly well throughout the playoffs before. So even even though there was sort of no panic for us going into that second game, uh, we, we had the team that had, had another level to turn up when we needed to. And, and that's one of the games where I felt as a group, uh, we, we said, just, just go out and win this one. So, we, so we're back even in the series. So the big uh, moment of that game, obviously, is the Marius, what they call his signature goal, uh, where he mm -hmm. took off from his own end and scored. Maybe each one of you guys could just talk about what your impressions were at that moment when Mario took off from his own end and went beat everybody to score. Yeah, I was on the bench. And I think I was like a couple of their defensemen. I was laying on the bench by the time he was done. It was uh... – <laughs> You know, pretty pretty impressive. Obviously, they, they made paintings of the goal. That's how impressive it was after. And, and you get even comments from the other team saying, wow, I mean, that was just absolutely an incredible goal. You come in, you know, one on two and kind of gives them the howdy-doody comes in. And then howdy-doody's, uh, you know, Casey Nett and, and uh, 
just a just a memorable goal for sure, and uh, one that uh, makes you appreciate him being on your team and not the other team. <laughs> I felt so sorry for Chambers on that one. Wasn't that Chambers <laughs> on the defense, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was sort of at the end of a shift. You know, I, I watched it, and it wasn't like early in the shift. It was maybe not at the very end, but it was pretty far into a shift. He had a lot of – still had a lot of energy to, you know, to make that play. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, it seems like a lot of these uh, offensive players find a second win when they can smell something good at the other end. But, uh, you know, just a comment on that goal for myself. Like, uh, even though I've been through it and I felt the pain, it's not a total surprise to see a player of Mario's caliber do that kind of stuff. Because if you see it every day, it, after a while, it just, you, you just you think this guy is unreal, the stuff he can do and, and, and produce with full speed and people hanging and then – the goalie charging out at him, be able to deke, uh, it's, 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 it's something special. In game two, off of you, uh, you took a pretty good run at Brian Bellows in the neutral zone. Do you remember doing that? I'm pretty sure he never scored a goal the whole playoff the playoff run against us. That's that's what I remember. It took, took a lot of pride in that, and sometimes the methods were a little old school, but uh, it worked at, at the time. Yeah, and, and I do remember that, you, you know, well – you also hit Jimmy Johnson on the on the wall from behind. Took a penalty when it was three nothing, but uh, in game four, we'll get to that later. But uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people don't realize things that happen early in a series pay dividends later on. So you were obviously making them pay the price right from the start. Bello seemed to become pretty much of a target for you guys during the course of that series. Was he a guy that you well, he, really he, felt like you had to, to sort of target, if you if you will? Yeah, he, he was one of their, you know, top players. I mean, they, they had, like we talked about earlier, some balanced offense, but he was certainly one of the, the guys that they were relying on to produce. So he, he was the one of the guys we were targeting for sure. Okay, so let's uh, move on now. You get uh, to the uh, to Minnesota, and you find out in the uh, warm-ups that Mario has back spasms and he's not going to be able to play. So you drop that game. And I know Phil Bork loves to talk about this, but after the loss in game, three in many, which was a 3-1 score. Uh, there was some talk in the, uh, in the papers about the, the parade route for the North Stars to win the Cup. And they – I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard also that they were talking about getting fitted for their rings. Yeah, that point. I heard that uh, too, yeah. How much, is, how much is that true, guys? Do you, and what do you remember about that? I think Phil Bork started those rumors. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get us all upset. Yeah. It worked. Well, I know there was something in the paper about the parade route. So, but uh, you know, a lot of times people like to make big deal about you know things that are on the locker room uh, bulletin board, things like that. But Ronnie, but uh, he had enough motivation to win a Stanley Cup. But there was was there a little bit of that as 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 a, the with all the uh, you know the gapping that was going on on the ice, were you able to kind of fit some of that stuff in there? Or how would you to characterize that aspect of the motivational factor? Well, I, I, I would be 100% sure that they weren't raising themselves for rings at that point. Um, that was probably just false. But, uh, you know, a lot of times the cities maybe do some work on, on planning for a parade, road, parade route in case. Uh, and, and that could have got out that way, not so much from the other team, because I'm sure the other team is like us. They want to keep everything sort of private and don't give the other team any sort of, uh, you know, ammunition to, to come back at them. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is what we all dreamed about. Winning was the Stanley Cup. This is where that close to it. The emotions are running high. Um, you know, you get on the ice and you do everything you possibly can to win for you and your teammates and your fans and your organization. And, and uh, you know, the, the peripheral stuff uh, just kind of goes away once the puck is dropped. Watching the telecast, I heard that Bob Johnson told uh, Scotty Bowman, who relayed it on to uh, um, one of the broadcasters, that he was very nervous going into game four. He, was, he just wasn't quite sure, you know, and he knew that Mario was coming back. Grant Jennings was plugged back into the lineup, so that was a big deal. And uh, Two studs coming back. Storming. It was unbelievable. How, <laughs> if you remember, Arden scored walking out from below the goal line of 58 seconds in to make a one nothing. Then, uh, you, know, it, you know, all of a sudden, uh, Ronnie, you got a goal. And Mario scored to make a three nothing. So uh, talk about that goal if you re what you remember. I know already was steaming down the right wing, and you were just driving to the net. You know, in the playoffs, it, it, it and it's a different era, I think, than, than it is today. Um, 
you know, certainly it was a lot tougher, I think, back then to get to the front of the net, especially with defensemen like, you know, Grant and, and Alfie and, and others around the league at the time, the way they played. But, uh, you know, usually if you could fight your way to the front of the net, you got rewarded. And, and in that case, uh, I was fortunate I got, got rewarded and, and whacked in a rebound and uh, got, us, uh, got us moving forward again. You guys were flying. It was 3 nothing. Mario scored. It was 2.58 into the period, and it was 3 nothing. What's the good news? Bad news is it was 2.58 into the period, and it was 3 nothing. You still had a long way to go. Uh, <laughs> what do you remember about all that? Because you, knowing how that team continued to generate chances and the way they were playing on their home ice, and the, the fans were unbelievable in that building, right? That was really loud. So you had to know it was still going to be a long night, if you will, if it even if it came out you know, in, in the right outcome. Well, what I remember was uh, that uh, it, it happened very quick, and, and like you said, we had a lot of time. And obviously, when the team is down three, they they they're all in. So they did get one, and then I think they got two quick ones, and and then um, if I'm not mistaken, I think we we uh, Troy Lone got a five minute penalty. So we we had yes, a, we're, we're, yeah we were uh, up a goal and a five minute penalty kill, and and I think Tommy had some unreal saves and. No, he didn't. I think they, they may not have had a shot on net that power play. I remember they did the not get played. a shot. One That's of the greatest right. penalty killings performances of all time. Yeah, you're right. Tommy had some saves before that and, and, and after, I think. But during that, uh, we gave him a breather there in that five-minute power play. I, mean, I remember that was uh, the highlight that I do remember from that game, from my perspective. What did you guys do? Uh, uh, what do you remember, Jenner, about what your game plan was to stop their power play? Because they – they were on fire, and then all of a sudden they were one for twenty in the series. They started. They scored a couple of power play goals in this game to get back into the game, as we, as you said, Alfie. But uh, in the meantime, you had really done a great job against their power play, which no one could do up up to that point. What do you remember about what they wanted you guys to do to stop it? Well, I think you know, just being at, at that you know at that moment or that point of the playoffs, um, you're going to be blocking shots. You're going to be, you know doing that extra just to get the fuck out, you know, and relying on Tommy, the way he was playing, like I said before, you know, firing the puck out when they would jump it in and try and put pressure on us. He, he did take a lot of pressure off of us uh, with his handling of the puck. But, I mean, uh, we, you know, we took pride in our penalty kill, you know, all, you know, coming from, you know, Hartford even before we got traded, you know. I mean, it was just a big part of our game. Me and Alfie and Ronnie too. So I don't know. We just carried it over, and and uh, it worked out for us. Ronnie uh, Brian Trotche made it four to one. I don't know if you remember this, but there were three peng- <clears throat> guys in the box for the Penguins: Murphy, Mario, and and Stevens. All were in the box, <laughs> and uh, they got screwed up on what the penalties when the one started and when they ended, and it was at least a ten minute delay while they were trying to figure it all out. And you were right in the middle of that, Ron. You were talking to Andy Van Helleman, and you were – it looked to me like you knew what was supposed to be happening, but they just weren't listening. What do you remember about that? I think I was just asking Andy how the wife and kids were. It was fun. <laughs> no, I, I, I think in, in, uh, in any of those situations, you're trying to make sure that uh, – you know that things are, are handled correctly, and if if you if you have an opinion that might help in that, you're trying to share it with the referee in a nice way. But uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know it, it's their call, and and, the, and along with the guys in the box. I mean, a little different today with the video. There was no uh, you know video calls to Toronto at that point, but uh, a little bit of crazy times for sure. Well, let's if we could, if we could get in a little bit deeper into that that, that penalty kill because that was uh, maybe the maybe the most key thing in the whole series if you really think about it because you guys needed to win this game you're up uh, you know four to one in the game they're they they made it four to three and now here you are in a, in a really tough situation they don't even get a shot on goal I mean the, 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 the recollection of that of your, so my recollection of that was the adjustment we have made was trying to trying to stand them up more in the neutral zone I think. You know, they were coming through, as you mentioned earlier, with a lot of speed and a lot of situations. And, and what we tried to do is really, you know, stand them up at the blue line so we, we wouldn't let them have that sort of easy entry into the zone and get set up against us. And it, it seemed to work well for us. You guys had 7D in those games because Paul Coffey returned just to play the power play. And I, I, I kind of felt for him and watching him. Uh, what what was that like, having a, a one less forward? And, and how, how did Badger adjust 
you know, to having seven D in his lineup, but only using Goff on the power play. Well, I think uh, it, it works at, at times. I'm not a big fan of 7D, and, and sh certainly Paul Coffey wasn't at the time. <laughs> I remember him arguing pretty hard to get out there a number of times. But, uh, you know, he, he had obviously some issues with that jaw. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it worked out fine. Uh, you know, he, like, it's, like I said, if you have someone that specializes mostly on the power play, you, you, otherwise it, it's hard to get enough ice time to keep uh, seven guys uh, in the game. I remember late in that uh, penalty kill, uh, John Casey tripped Phil Bork. So that evened things up. And uh, then it was Borky who scored into the empty net. Uh, so you still had a lot of more work to do, you know, weathering that storm right up till the end of the hockey game. Um, what was that feeling like to, to finally get that big win in front of that crowd and, uh, and know that you could, you know, do something that a lot of teams up to that point were having a lot of trouble doing? North Stars, I think, had won nine or ten of eleven at home uh, up up to that point. You finally found a way to beat them. It, now it becomes a best of three series with two of those games coming back to our rink, and uh, you know you don't want to go down three one against anybody, uh, let alone a team that's that's you know been pretty much unbeatable in their own rink. So uh, to get that gave us the confidence. We come back home and and. Uh, you know, we knew the focus had to be on game five. And, and historically, the percentage you show you win game five, you win the series. So that, that's kind of where our focus was at that point. Okay, so you win the game. We're not going to get into all the details of, uh, of, of the next two games, but I do want to ask you, if I could, just about uh, winning the Cup. Uh, obviously, you go into game six, and everything that I remember, guys, is that you really thought you were going to win. Like in the locker room before the game, there was no doubt in your minds you were going to win. There was a real strong feeling of confidence going into that. Game six. Can you just talk about what it was like in the room before the game? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think confidence was one word that was uh, kind of floating around that room, uh, but but also that level of uh, different play that this team had. That if there was a time to to back check, if there was a time to block a shot, even even for the superstars, like that's uh, that's when everyone decided to do it, and, and obviously. We, we got lucky with the score that game, but uh, every every single person in that room knew we were going to win that game. That's just that was the kind of team that team was at that time. I think we all really knew we were going to win when you scored the first goal off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and on the power play, and I'm not going to pull a Jenner and say it was top shelf, but he went in. <laughs> and then it's it's over, and you win. So, you know, I remember Badger saying. They'll appreciate this more 30 years from now than they do now. So we're, we're 30 years away almost. I remember back feel? before that game, though, I, um, I received a hit, a body check from uh, Madonna the game before. And so in game six, he comes up to me before the game, and he's like, They're gonna, you know, I'm going to freeze my shoulder up so I can play. And he's like, he wasn't uh, as confident as I thought he would be about that game because he was like, well, I, I really want to save you for a game seven. You know, I really, you know, but I'm like, well, okay. So then that's when, then they put Jimmy back in instead of me, but you know, then, then we uh, end up winning eight nothing. So I was like, Badger, you got a little nervous there for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Took me out of the lineup, but anyway, it, it all turned out good, you know. So when you look back at it as we close this thing out, you get traded on March 4th to Pittsburgh. You really believe that, you know, people are starting to talk positively real quickly about this team having something special about it. Um, when you look back on it now, what was it all – how does it all sit with you now just uh, 30 years later about winning that first Stanley Cup, you guys, and doing it as former Whalers who came to Pittsburgh as a group? Well, for, for me, it was uh... – it was a perfect fit. I mean, you look at a lot of trades that uh, teams make around the league every year, and, and some are good, some are not so good. But uh, th this really was a void that uh, Pittsburgh uh, didn't have. They had they had a lot of things, but they they, they missed exactly what me and Grant and, and Ronnie could bring uh, to, to the team. So I, I think it's just to me that stands out, and and then. We got rolling and, and, and we got involved. And as Ronnie said, we, we became a, a part of the team pretty quick. And, and then um, you know, we, we just kind of rolled on and, and uh, every, everyone kind of maxed out. A lot of players played as good as they probably had during their careers at, at that particular time that year and the following two years. So 
it, it was it was a quite a ride for me that I'm, I haven't seen or been part of before or after. Ronnie, what was the celebration like? I read a story where your dad was like posing in bed with the cup and in a bathtub, and <laughs> you had a good time with uh, with that cup when you took it home. Yeah, no, I mean, I think every one of us as a kid, you dream about winning the Stanley Cup, right? And and you, you look back on it today, there's so many different things. We get traded. I, I remember, I think we had played three games and, and going to dinner with uh, Ulf after and saying to him, you know, hey, this this team can win the cup. You know, if we get the bounces, we get the breaks, we can win the cup. And, you know, you, you, every team that's won the cup will tell you there's things that happen along the way that maybe shouldn't have happened, but they did, and they allowed you to win the cup. The save, you know, Frank Peter Angelo was a huge part of that. I remember uh, as the playoffs were starting, uh, we went to the movie theater and coming out of the theater, looking up in the sky and seeing a shooting star, and you, you say you make, a, make your wish, and, you know, you wish to win the Stanley Cup. And I'm not saying that's why we did it. For three months later, you, you win it, right? We, we won at the end of the year. We're having the celebration. We're walking out of the Grand Concourse. The, car, the cup is sitting there. And I said to the security guy, who's taking it? He goes, I don't know. I said, I got it. And this was before the days of the, you know, the chaperone with the cup. So I brought it home, uh, called my neighbors. I think within two minutes, they were at the house. And uh, we're having champagne and celebrating. And just the look on my dad's face, uh, you know, was just so excited to have it. And I said, Dad, do some things. He, you know, sit in the bathtub. He had his pants on. But, you know, take your shirt <laughs> off and pretend you're taking a uh, you know, a tub with the, with the Stanley Cup. So he did that, lay in bed with the Stanley Cup. And, and it was like he was six years old again. He was, he was grinning from ear to ear and, and just so special to win that trophy, even more special to share it with the people uh, that are a part of your life and that helped you attain that goal for sure. And what about that airport scene? A, a little story on that one, Stag. We get off and obviously, you know, it's, it's all crazy. And then they tell us we can't go downtown. So we got these yellow school buses and we go to Tommy Brasso's house. I think it's about 4.30 or so in the morning. And, and we've kind of had enough. We got the girls. Jeanette's pregnant. We're going to go back to the uh, airport. That's right. So we get one of the yellow yeah. school buses. We cross over the bridge, uh, the bottom of Swickley there, heading towards the back ways to the airport. And the bus runs out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're sitting there on the side of the road, and the truck pulls up. And, I, and the guy says, you know, what's going on? I said, I, I look, and he's got the newspaper in the front seat of his car, and it's got Stanley Cup champions. And I said, you're not going to believe that, but that picture, that's us. I said, our bus ran out of gas. We need a ride to the airport. So the three <laughs> girls uh, jump in the front seat with him. All, uh, Jenner and I get in the back seat, and we get out yeah. at the airport, and all three of our suits are just absolutely covered head to toe in dog hair. This guy must have had golden <laughs> retrievers, and we were just buried in dog hair. But yeah. We ended up jumping in the car, driving downtown, and that's, uh, that's how we finished off the first night of, of celebrating winning the Cup. So a lot of crazy things happened. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Ronnie, first of all, <clears throat> congratulations on being the general manager of the new Seattle franchise. I know Alfie's going to be working with you. Jenner, we're your way up there in Alaska right now, right? Yeah, I'm in Alaska, yeah. Not too far from Seattle, though. <laughs> <laughs> still an airplane mechanic? Yeah, I'm still working on uh, aircraft, yep. You can bring me down some salmon anytime you want, Jen. Yeah, I will. Okay, uh, thank you very much, you guys. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, there's another cup to talk about, too. And uh, I'll be talking to some of your teammates about that. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Everybody thanks, stay thanks. Safe. Okay, that's Ron Francis, all Samuelson and Grant Jennings. I'm Paul Steiger. Well, thanks for watching, everybody.